It's not unusual to have 8 cores in a modern CPU, but it's also not common. Like, there aren't any 8 core Celerons, but you'd still think twice before stepping up from a Ryzen 7600X to a 7700X. 8 cores is still something you pay that bit extra for even now, and unlike old quad core i5s, nobody's flogging them on eBay for less than a tenner like they're going out of fashion. Wait, what the f- Intel have been making 8-core CPUs for their server market since the Sandy Bridge Extreme platform back in 2012, though they didn't market them to consumers. The Enthusiast i7 chips for this platform, using the first version of the LGA 2011 socket, were all either 4 or 6-core designs. I've actually reviewed the i7-3820, 4930K and 3960X in the past, videos for which are linked in the description. 8 cores were originally held in reserve for the enterprise market, branded as Xeons. The Xeon model numbering system is a bit harder to read than the consumer version, but a quick browse through the Intel archive shows no less than 18 different SKUs, mostly distinguished by their clock speeds and whether they can be used in multi-CPU configurations. The one I have here is the E52670, a model number which identifies it as a big socket Xeon that can be used in up to a dual CPU configuration. With 20 megabytes of L3 cache, a 2.6 gigahertz base clock, and 3.3 gigahertz boost clock on one core, it isn't the premier 8 core experience of 2012. That would be the E52687W, which has a 500 megahertz higher boost clock, but whose price is still up there in the two digit range, and that felt like too big of a commitment. There are a number of cheaper, lower clocked 8 cores that can be had for substantially less. I picked up my E52670 for under £6, but prices have now climbed to just under £10. By today's standards, the 2670 is a dinosaur, with a 115 watt TDP and no support for newer AVX2 or 512 instructions, and although it boasts quad channel memory support, it's limited to DDR3. For modern gamers, there's still not a whole lot to recommend it beyond the number of cores and threads. Although you can install these Xeons into enthusiast-grade X79 boards like my ASUS here, you won't be overclocking this chip. The multiplier's locked, the base clock can only be moved by a couple of megahertz before it starts causing problems, and after 9 CPU generations, even if half of them were 14 nanometer, Sandy Bridge performance just ain't what it used to be. So why the excitement? Why make a video about a decade old server chip? Well, perhaps you missed the part where I said it was £10! Combined with a cheap remanufactured motherboard from AliExpress, a low-cost air cooler and some basic ECC RAM, you could be up and running for less than the cost of a modern motherboard. To simulate this as best I can with my available hardware, I've dropped the E52670 into my ASUS X79 Rampage 4 Extreme, but replaced my usual 240mm AIO with a Cooler Master Hyper 212, and dropped the DDR3 speeds to 1600 mega transfers a second, which is the top rated speed according to Intel specification. My initial benchmarking tests found that the CPU doesn't really go beyond its 2.6 GHz base clock when all cores are being loaded, however I was able to exceed that without overclocking. Using throttle stops power limit controls I was able to lift the CPU's TDP, and while the chip was still using nowhere near the rated 115 watts according to hardware info, it did manage to add a pretty tidy 400 MHz to the overall clock speed. As Throttle Stop is a simple Windows app, I think it should work on even locked down motherboards, so this could be a good solution for those of you with AliExpress specials. To make sure I'm getting the most out of the CPU, I'm testing with the best GPU I own, the GeForce RTX 3070. I'll admit, I was fairly impressed how well the Xeon handled Valorant. There are a few things I've figured out about the game in the last few months, and I was under the impression that the low 3GHz clock speeds would count against it way more than the core count would help. Whether the 20MB cache helps make up for it, I don't know, but the 186fps average brings this about level with the over 40% higher clocked i7-3820, and only 20% below the i7-3960X. 
It's still not a ringing endorsement from me. If you want a dirt cheap Valorant build, there are equally good or better options for not all that much more money. But if you want to play the occasional deathmatch, then the 2670 can deliver the goods. Again, I was pleasantly surprised how the E5 2670 held up in Battlefield 5. In the two matches I played, stuttering was relatively minimal and averages were very healthy. The 100 FPS average I measured is pretty much in line with all the other Sandy and Ivy Bridge chips I've tested in this title, with the exception of the heavily overclocked 1680 V2. But 1% lows were significantly better than several of this chip's contemporaries. I've said in the past that Sandy Bridge isn't up to the task of running Battlefield 5 smoothly, I think this has just proven me wrong. Now, this is going to sound weird, but I was having a pretty decent time playing Fortnite on this setup, in performance mode, gliding along at 150 FPS on average with lows in the 70s. I didn't win either match in my benchmarking run, far from it, but from a purely technical perspective I've had worse experiences in this game. So it kind of shocked me when I input the results into my spreadsheet and found that this was actually the second worst result I've ever seen ahead of only the borderline war crime that is the i3-2100. Now, I don't normally review CPUs I think are going to be trash, so it kind of makes sense that the worst CPU I test would still do a decent job, but this just seemed counterintuitive to me. On the other hand, the flight simulator result was kind of expected. The E5-2670 is an okay choice, but not a great choice for this simulator. While the engine can clearly use multiple threads, it also really benefits from higher clocks, and I suspect that AVX2 might be a significant factor here as well. The 32 FPS average and less than cinematic 1% and 0.1% aren't game breaking, but they aren't optimal either. <music> Meanwhile, Spider Man's performance is also pretty dire. Without RT, the E5-2670 can manage to hit a 60 FPS average, and that might be all you're looking for in a CPU. However, this is once again the worst result I've seen from something that isn't a dual core worth 10 British pennies. With RT enabled, the experience is pretty rough, but better than many of the other CPUs I've tested. Right up until the point the game freezes for a few seconds while the high quality assets load in. I've seen this a couple of times on low-end and older GPUs, and I haven't figured out exactly what causes it, but whatever the cause, I'd say it's a good idea to steer clear of ray tracing with the 2670. Cyberpunk 2077 actually performs better on the 2670 than you might expect, considering how the other AAA titles have fared so far. Its 52 FPS average without RT is distinctly mid-table, and a long way off what the higher clocked Socket 2011 chips can achieve, but also a cut above the mainstream desktop chips of the time. Dropping quality to medium and DLSS to balanced does nothing to the average, as the GPU is far from being taxed at this point, but I've started keeping track of this in case I review higher-end CPUs in the near future. When RT is enabled, again at DLSS balanced, the CPU is still firmly middle of the pack, averaging 42 FPS. The Red Dead Redemption 2 results put the E5-2670 in a similar position, though the margins are much greater. The Xeon beats some of the other budget and even not so budget competition, and does so by a massive margin. At over 70 FPS on average, this brings the 2670 much closer to chips like the i7-7700, and leaves other bargain basement chips in the dust. This is seriously impressive. Which is more than I can say for Elden Ring. As I've said elsewhere, there isn't much point testing this title on high-end CPUs as they all come within a stone's throw of each other, but at the low end, this game really sorts out the weaker chips. 47 FPS is almost 30% short of the 60 FPS cap, and only brings the 2670 in line with the 4.3 GHz i7 3820 and the flat quad-core i5 2500K at 4.5 GHz. 
Again, I'm not calling this unplayable, and if you're stuck with a motherboard that can't overclock, then this might be as good as you can get without a bigger upgrade, but it's still not a very competitive result for the Xeon. I've added Witcher 3 Remastered, but for the time being it's kind of without context. I haven't actually got round to doing any more CPU testing in this title as yet, though in the long run it will be replacing Elden Ring. My ride through Novigrad proved to be stuttery as hell at first. Whether this is a limitation of the CPU or an engine problem remains to be seen. Nevertheless, a quick reload smooths things out. At 1440 high, with DLSS balanced and hair works turned off, neither the CPU nor GPU are overly utilised, both chilling in the 30s and 40s, so I may have to find a more optimal setup that doesn't sacrifice visuals. Still, it does go to show that the E5 2670 can't produce more than about 42 FPS on average in more demanding areas. Finally, the Civ 6 AI benchmark managed an average turn time of 7.47 seconds, almost half a second faster than a locked desktop i7 of the same generation, and almost half a second slower than an overclocked 6 core HEDT i7 for the same platform. Is this impressive? In my opinion, yes and no. I can understand why someone might look at these numbers and be unimpressed, especially when compared to anything from the last three or four years. The thing is, as I've already mentioned, this CPU could be purchased along with a cheap motherboard and 16 gigs of DDR3 for less than the cost of a motherboard for those new platforms. And while there's not much in the way of an upgrade path open to the AliExpress, X79 shoppers, on a severely limited budget or in a region where new components are dramatically more expensive than they are in the rest of the world, this could be a pretty compelling option. While the Xeon does come almost dead last in several tests, second only to a glorified 1155 socket protector, there aren't many examples of games that the 2670 can't at least give a playable experience in. Paired up with some of the more common GPUs on AliExpress, like an 8GB RX 580, 5500 XT, 5600 XT, or a GTX 1660 Super, and you could have the beginnings of a modest value gaming machine. Of course, that assumes there are no better options for the same price, and that might not be the case. Knockoff X99 motherboards are all the rage nowadays, and while the step up to 2011 V3 comes at the cost of more expensive DDR4 RAM, it should bring a solid increase in gaming performance. Let me know in the comments if there are any cheap V3 or V4 Xeons you'd like to see me test out. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.